Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the third Sunday after Epiphany, January 22nd, 2023. Our texts are Isaiah 9, 1 through 4, Psalm 27, verse 1, followed by verses 4 through 9, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 18, and Matthew 4, 12 through 23. Back to Matthew, and now Jesus will call some followers, cause trouble. Mm -hmm. Ah, what do you mean by trouble? It seems like such an easy, well, it, Jesus says, come follow me, and you just do it. What's the trouble there, Matt? Well, keep reading. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, I, I think I made a big deal of this two years ago in year B, but it's, you know, the, the trigger for him to call disciples is the arrest of John. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, he's, we, he's been baptized. The spirit has come. He's survived the testing in the wilderness. We don't know how much time has passed, but there's something about John's arrested. He goes to Galilee. He withdraws, leaves his hometown to a more, um, slightly more populous, but a, a more, a town located, you know, on the sea there and starts gathering follow. I mean, this is what, this is what people who start movements do. <laughs> they leave, right. They leave home. They, they have an idea and he gets followers. And I, don't know, I think this is the, the, how he knows when it's time to get started or why, why he chooses when it's time to get started. Isn't just that he's, his friend is now in jail, but the, you know the local tyrant has crossed a line, and things aren't getting better on their own. Mm -hmm. that, that's why I, mean, I think there is something yeah. a little I don't know the right word to use here, but he's he's getting ready to stir things up, and he'll do that in the Sermon on the Mount in a really kind way by yeah. starting with "Blessed are the poor in spirit," and then ending with. If you build your house in the sand, it's going to come crashing down, folks. So. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, the first, the from that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. All right, well. Which is John's message, right? Exactly. And right. that's good news for some, but not so good news for the empire down the street, the powers that be down the street. And so it's this immediately declaration of God's empire, God's kingdom is, is now present in him. And that, yeah, that's, that, that's not going to be necessarily always a popular message. And so it's, uh, it's, and especially when you think about how this gospel starts and, and what we talked about with the, with, uh, with the epiphany texts of these competing kingdoms, if you will, or the way in which that, that, the empire is, uh, the imperial forces are threatened by, by this presence of Jesus as a new king and, and establishing a new, uh, a new empire, declaring a new kind of reign. And so you, we want to bring all of that to bear in these opening words of, 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 or these, this is the central message of Jesus, of Jesus ministry. And it's, it, it's, yeah, it's going to stir up a lot. And we're just getting started here. So, and yet, and yet they're these guys who follow him. I, um, I'm, I appreciated the commentary and especially this idea as you've been uh, referencing a, a tale of two kingdoms. Mm. Um, and, uh, this recognition that repentance is a prophetic call to return to God and follow God's law. So rather than apologies or laments, this is a surrender to follow the ancient wisdom of this tradition of the faith of the in the creator God and the promises that God has made. And so to choose to follow Jesus in this way, um, as you've just described, Caroline, it is, and, and, and you too, Matt, is is, is always going to be a disruption to national and political economic interests. Um, the, the commentator makes that, 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 that statement also. Um, it, and individually, it, it means that um, if, if we're disrupting the livelihood of the empire, 
uh, or the the economic system of the empire, it, it 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 means risking one's livelihood. But in the context of this text, like John, it possibly means risking one's life. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what it meant for African Americans in the nineteenth and twentieth centuries. Um, that's what it means for Ukrainians today. Um, and in these modern examples of people resisting the majority positions um, which satisfy the kingdoms of the world, um, whether that's political, national, and as a United Methodist, I'd risk saying ecclesial, um, what we are actually glimpsing is a countercultural disruption that was created by the first century followers of Jesus, those who said yes, knowing that it could you know, John's dead, it could mean our death. Um, but they make a decision to live beyond um, the caste and, class sex, caste and class structures of society and practice a peculiar standard of holiness, which in many ways is disastrous to the economic systems of the empire. And that's what gets you in trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and how what makes that appealing to people like Peter and Andrew and James and John? I mean, it, it, there's no. Sometimes this passage comes across as if there's something so charismatic about Jesus that they couldn't resist. <clears throat> you know that they're just drawn to the beauty or drawn to the light, but I think they're drawn mm-hmm. to a mission. They're drawn they know it's going to be it. dangerous. This is people saying, "I've had it. I'm fed up." I mean, I think they believe there's something better in following Jesus, but the impetus here seems to be enough of this garbage. Right. We're 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 gonna we're gonna cast our lot with this guy and and try something new. And not that it's hopeless, or not that it's just about kind of rebellion. But I think there you have to ask the question: What causes somebody to make this change? in terms of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, like what are they attracted to? And it sure isn't a vision of untold beauty, I don't think, or at least not solely that, is it? I, th- I think I'm, I'm, I'm bubbling up here, uh, Matt. Um, I think we have to remember that the um, first century Jews expectation of a Messiah was not the son of God. Um, it was, it was a political rebellion. It was this um, marginalization and oppression of the empire is going to stop um, for the people of God. That was what how they saw the promise. And so, yeah, there was, a, I think there was a sense of this might be the one who will get us out of this position. And being discipled, walking with Jesus, recovered the will of God, which was for all the world to live in this, um, I don't want to say harmony, um, I want to say wholeness, to experience peace, to experience where there is no hunger or thirst or marginalization for anyone. But that didn't come at the call. The call, I think, like you were kind of alluding in your question, Matt, was we're done. And and this might be a way of having victory over. And and John's death tells us it's time for us to get moving. But being discipled by Jesus completely changed their imagination of what peace looked like. It's not power over, it's 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 salvation for everyone. It's healing for everyone. I rambled that out. Yeah, which gets back to how important I think the Beatitudes are going to be for, yes. for Matthew's structure next chapter. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that uh, that I think the other thing too, and it's just a, maybe a little bit a uh, different direction, but I, I, verse 19, you know, follow, it's not just follow me, and but those next words are really critical and i will make you fish for people that that there is a 
invitation into a different, uh, there's a subtle invitation into a different kind of community or com communal nature, or that, that there is going to be a, an, an alternate <laughs> countercultural community, as you said, Joy, that, uh, that they're being invited into something uh, that makes them citizens of a different kind of, of a uh, different kind of reign. And, and that, uh, and that, and that their presence in that matters. Uh, I might be reading way too much into it, but it's, but I really do think that, you know, I will make you fish for people, uh, is so indicative of how different this, this community is going to be and what defines this community as we've already talked about and that this that this particularly when they're leaving their you know when they're uh leaving their father Zebedee <laughs> that yeah. this 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 new community is is not those those social political religious realities or constraints or it doesn't have to be constraints but uh, identifiers of a community are now also, uh, well, disrupted. <laughs> and so that, that, and, and so that it, then it invites, okay, so what are those, what are those identifiers and what are those allegiances to what are you now committing yourself to, you know, to what are you now committing yourself that's, that, other constructs have been in place that you had to obey or you you had to be uh, faithful to. I don't think you're reading too much into that, but I might be in what I'm about to say. And I'm just thinking of the echoes of, of last week where we talked so much about being a witness and being and bringing a testimony. And I know that was John, but um, to be a fisher of people, to be those who form a new community um, is, is actually in, in some ways bearing witness to what the creator God has always been doing, even as humanity continues to walk out of, of the narrative God has been narrating us into. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that might be reading too much into it. I, I, I think you were spot on, Caroline. <laughs> We should probably move to Isaiah. The, yes. Here's a text that we're used to hearing in Advent. And maybe mm -hmm. you want to add some verses to extend that or to remind people that mm -hmm. now that the baby's been born and is all grown up and is becoming a, a troublemaker, <laughs> like let's check in on the sun. But to help people get a sense for what's going on here, that this is um, right. I, the prophet's promising the king that even though the Assyrians are on the march in the north and things have been bad for Zebulun and Naphtali, right? There've been these incursions that, and now you've got, you know, Israel coming against Judah. And so Isaiah is telling the king of Judah, like, hang in there. It's going to be fine. Don't make an alliance. Trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so to promise healing for those two northern tribes that are, are getting sacked by the Assyrians and to talk about I talk about Galilee, a place that Judah shouldn't really even care about. It's not their kingdom anymore. And mm -hmm. but then to talk about, you know, light shining, you know, the the idea of breaking the yoke of a burden, being under the dominion of a of a marauding empire being broken. If he add verses, you'll get, you know, the boots of the soldiers being burned for the fire. I mean, this mm -hmm. this is crazy talk coming at a time when right when parts of parts of Israel in the north are on fire, essentially, and, and this is real politicking going on with whom should I ally? And the prophet keeps saying, don't worry about it. There's a new king coming. Don't ally with anybody. Trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. So it's again, you know, you have to pull people into some of the imperial. What's the word I want? Machinations or just the and the real world survival. That's obviously John experiences in his own body. But now tribes and kingdoms back in Isaiah are also experiencing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to say, why does Jesus go to Galilee is at least the, the lectionary committee or people who read a lot of Isaiah will say, well, there's some, there's some resonance here. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I, I'm going to quote from the commentary. I, I think she does a, 
a, a wonderful job of offering us a, a fruitful redirection uh, for reading this passage, both uh, in terms of the history of ancient, the, the historical context of ancient Israel, um, but also of reading in the first centuries before and after um, the incarnation. Um, so the line that I want to quote is, in the midst of political instability, shaky alliances, uncertain futures, Isaiah reminds Ahaz and all those who encounter this text, Emmanuel, God is with us. What is more, God's presence is a shining light, piercing whatever darkness we encounter. I, I think that sums up what you were pointing to, to Matt, and um, to being able to take real history, in this case, the history of ancient Israel, and that becomes the word for the first century. I mean, we would think that's ancient too, but that was old history for them that became a promise. And it's still for us a promise that in the midst of divisions, which we'll talk about again, um, God is showing up and in showing up, uh, redirecting the kind of communities that are formed. Mm -hmm. And and then I, I think I'll lead us into the psalm because it's the it's that same kind of promise that you just read. You know, God's presence is a shining light piercing whatever darkness we encounter. And how does the preacher, yeah, how does the preacher carry forward through this whole year, Matthew's main claim that Jesus is God with us, that Emmanuel, and that that Isaiah gives witness to it here. And then you have the Psalm, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That And to what extent these are the exact words that the disciples had to say over and over again or as they, as they followed Jesus and realized had, and began to have a greater realization of what was at stake and the risks that were, that were going to be necessary and the kinds of powers that they would come up against, which we've already seen in the gospel of Matthew. And so, and yet the Lord is my light and salvation. Why, why would I fear any of this? Why would I, why would I be, uh, yeah. Why, why would I fear any of this? Of whom shall I be afraid? Because that's, that's my reality. So I think that's the Psalm can be used to uh, give language to some of what we've already talked about. That, that's exactly it. It rehearses why one keeps hope in God. Mm -hmm. It gives words to what God has done that brings that assurance. Uh, mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. would I would invite using these ancient words within the sermon, um, mm -hmm. whether as a prayer for help or in claiming the absolute dependence on God. It yeah. offers, as you just said, Caroline, vocabulary right. from the past that gives voice for the hope of the present. And it links our faith to the faith of those who left us a legacy of promise. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's Corinthians. I like how it ends. <laughs> I mean, I the whole passage, but the way, you know, it, it takes us into, you know, this theme that Paul's going to unpack in the, in later in chapter one, right? the message about the cross is foolishness mm -hmm. to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. I mean, you know me, I'm usually a one text at a time kind of person, but I, I read See, this in light of Matthew 4. You read Matthew 4 and you think, these guys are going to get crushed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Herod Antipas has arrested John and, and Jesus and his four new friends are going to like somehow, you know, change anything. This guy is going to be dead within months or a couple of years. And of course, he, I mean, you know, the way that reading this as a neutral observer, you think, Oh no, what a waste of some good young lives here of people who think they can make a difference. And it's, of course, how it's going to look on Good Friday. Yeah. But, you know, what a waste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the upside downness of the gospel, now using Paul's words, that mm -hmm. somehow in that, in what looks like, you know, a very compassionate but slightly foolhardy kind of movement, 
the power of God is at work mm-hmm. um, towards salvation. So, mm-hmm. and I think too. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Were you going to? It, just, it, it gets to the question of how does this how does this epiphanic light shine? And sometimes it it shines in really um, unseen ways and um, ironically, like upside down ways. But go ahead, please. Well, and too that. I think I think particularly the that phrase of for the message about the cross is foolishness, and we would say to the the disciples following Jesus is foolishness, and so but that's it's the way in which, like you said, it's the way in which the power of God is revealed in these in these ways that are not not at all socially <clears throat> politically religiously whatever acceptable uh and they seem foolish and and that i think a preacher could even unpack that like what do we mean by what does foolishness look like or what is it what does it mean and the sort of the i uh, we we experience manifestations of god often and in uh in great experiences or obvious experiences and so part of what you're saying matt and part of what epiphany is 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 giving witness to and paying attention to the manifestations of god that are in these unexpected ways and in unexpected people following like the wise men and now these fishermen and uh and so uh, are, are we also giving witness to that as well? Not just the not just the grandeur, but in the foolishness and the counterculturalness, and as you said, Joy, I think is an important theme. Oh. I think the answer to that is probably no. I, I mean, um, I, think- I, I paid attention to the divisions um, that leads this, and um, uh, want to put out there for for preachers to consider. Um, we talk a lot about coming together and I want to suggest that coming together is not an adequate goal. It's more a description of uh, our appropriate disposition. The goal, uh, our goal needs to be what I think is expressed in the canon of scripture, which is this foolishness. Um, it's to bear witness to the presence of light and darkness. It's to bear witness, it's to testify to the promise that God with us is good news. Um, it's the foolishness uh, of the cross. And, and when the people of God practice what is no divisions, a, a countercultural hospitality, it, it offers a glimpse of the transformational power of God's peace. Um, we've experienced um, that glimpse when we look at a brutal economic culture of chattel slavery that is moving toward integration and equity. We experience that glimpse when a caste system of of elites and outcasts uh, begin to work together as siblings rather than servants and masters. Um, we, We get a glimpse of this um, unusual or countercultural hospitality um, that doesn't fit um, the classifications of our society. Um, and so if we read further in, in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, we recognize that the goal is simply to proclaim Christ crucified, which is still foolishness to the economic and academic elites. And, and yet the gifts that we possess, kind of going back to last week, but also moving ahead in Corinthians, the gift that we possess are not what the empire classifies them as, enshrining ethnocentrism or nationalism or racism or sexism and classism, but rather the gifts we possess are the manifestation of the spirit that is for the common good. It is... It is extending hospitality so it's not just my group or my tribe, but it is forming a new community that is only revealed when 
We don't settle for the government's good, and we long for the Creator God's promise of righteousness.